What's going on besties? This is your comprehensive all-in-one study guide for everything that you need to know about the T7 reading section of the exam. Let's get started. So first up, we have topic sentences. These are usually the first sentence of every paragraph. So here's the key point. You can often answer many of these exam questions just by reading that topic sentence. The rest is just elaboration, so pay attention to the supporting details if they're needed. So say, for example, if you have a question that's asking you about supporting details, you want to read that paragraph with the topic sentence first and then choose the answer that's going to best fit what is that topic. So we're going to be doing this in practice to tie this all together, but just kind of get that idea in the back of your head. Next, we have main idea. So the main idea is essentially the thesis statement. Think of it as the core message that the paragraph is trying to convey. Often you're going to find this as the last sentence in that first paragraph. So if you have a question that asks you about main idea of a passage, quickly check that last sentence of that first paragraph and mark your answer and move on. We don't have a whole lot of time on the reading section. So usually with these kind of sentence, these kind of questions, you're going to be able to answer them pretty quickly if you know where to find them. Next up, we have supporting details. We kind of talked about that one a little bit. That's that supporting details being the bulk of the paragraph, and it's going to make up the details that support that topic sentence that you're going to find in the first sentence of every paragraph. And then lastly, we have summary. So with summary, you're going to want to think of like back in school when you summarize essays for particular classes, right? You're going to use that same knowledge that you gained back then to write a conclusion or a restatement of that thesis. So similarly, a passage's summary is typically the last paragraph's first sentence. That is where it's going to be found on the T's exam. If there's any questions about the passage's summary, go straight to that sentence, choose your answer, and keep it moving. Let's take a look at some practice questions to help us tie this all together. So just to kind of give you a quick overview of what you're looking at, I've highlighted what is a topic sentence, main idea, and supporting details within the paragraph. So starting up here at the top in the red, we have our topic sentence. That is incorporating a well-balanced diet is key to maintaining overall health and wellness. Then we have our supporting details. That's everything that's in here in the blue. This is everything that's going to build up that topic sentence. So a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lean proteins provides essential nutrients that the body needs to function effectively. These foods can lower the risk of chronic illness such as heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. Furthermore, a balanced diet supports immune system health and aids in weight management. And then our last sentence down here in purple, that is our main idea. So it's bringing together everything we just kind of talked about. Therefore, making a conscious food choices is a fundamental step towards a healthier, more vibrant life. So this is what it's going to look like when you're taking the teas. This is how you're going to break it down. So I always highly recommend that when you are looking at your paragraph, read the question first and then dive in to see specifically what it is asking and look for those particular sentences. So like I just said before, these are important tips that you're going to want to remember when you are taking your T's exam specifically for reading. Number one, you want to read the question first. This is the most crucial part of the test and you want to make sure you're doing this. Read the question carefully and completely before anything else. Don't waste your time reading the passage first, then reading the question and having to go back. It's just unnecessary. Sometimes reading the passage, like I said, is unnecessary and the answer can be found in the question itself. So for example, identifying opinions in a statement, you're going to want to look for words like should, good, best, or most. That's going to help you kind of break down the questions and you might not even have to read the passage at all. Avoid starting with longer passages. Some T's test takers even like to take notes. So I know that when I took my T's, I was taking notes about this is the topic sentence, this is supporting details, this is main idea. You're not going to have a whole lot of time for that. It's great if you do that because when you go to nursing school, you're going to have to take notes like that, but specifically for the T's, answer the question and move on. Tip number two is don't leave questions blank. In the T's, this test is timed, and it's important that you manage that time effectively. So for your initial approach, you're going to want to answer each question first when you encounter it, because you might not have time to go back. 
Um, strategic guessing is also really good. If you're uncertain about an answer, it's better to make an educated guess initially rather than leaving it blank and considering you know, it later when it comes to your time constraints, you might not be able to go back. And then lastly, we have narrowing down. This is a great method. So it's the elimination method where you're gonna reduce your choices. So it's gonna increase your odds of answering the question correctly and it's gonna give you a 50% chance of getting it right. So let's take a look at our first practice question. As I said, read the question first. So the question is, which sentence in the paragraph best serves as the topic sentence? So remember, topic sentence is usually the first sentence in the first paragraph. So I'm gonna read the entire thing, just so that you have it, but we're gonna be looking at that first sentence. So advancements in renewable energy technologies have become crucial in combating climate change. Solar and wind power in particular has been significant developments in efficiency and affordability. Governments and private sectors are increasing investing in these technologies, recognizing their long-term benefits for the environment and economy. Such investments can only reduce carbon emissions, but also create job opportunities in new industries. The shift towards renewable energy sources is therefore not only an environmental imperative, but also an economic opportunity. So again, what is our first sentence? Advancements in renewable energy technologies have become crucial in combating climate change. So as we take a look at our answers here, does there anything that states that topic sentence that we just read. Let me see, solar and wind power in particular have been seen significant developments in efficiency and affordability. Nope, that's not it. Advancements in renewable energy technologies have become crucial in combating climate change. Yep, that's just what we talked about. Governments and private sectors are increasing investing in these technologies. Nope, and the shift towards renewable energy sources is therefore not only an environmental imperative, imperative, but also an economic opportunity. We know that's the main idea because that was actually the last sentence of that paragraph. So you've guessed it, you're correct. The correct answer is B. Advancements in renewable energy technologies have become crucial in combating climate change. You see how much time we would have wasted had we read the entire thing? We just read that first sentence, there it is, that is our topic sentence. Let's take a look at our next practice question. So again, we want to read the question first. What is the main idea of the paragraph? So we know main idea, we're looking at the last sentence of that paragraph. So going back, let's take a look. The last sentence is, therefore, while AI brings significant advancements and convenience, it also necessitates careful considerations of its broader societal implications. So going back to our question, we have, AI is significantly improving efficiency in various industries. That's not correct. Ethical concerns are a minor part of AI development. No, that's not what our main idea stated. AI role in transportation and medical diagnostics is revolutionary. No, and AI brings significant advancements in convenience. It also necessitates careful consideration of its broader societal implications. Yes, D is our correct answer. Remember, when we're looking at main idea, we're particularly looking at the last sentence in the first paragraph. Look how much time we saved. Let's take a look at our next practice question. Again, we want to read the question first. Which of the following is a supporting detail found in the paragraph? So again, we're looking at that bulk of the paragraph. So we're gonna to have to pay a little bit more attention to this question. Our first sentence is our topic sentence. The study of astrophysics has led to remarkable discoveries about the universe. So that is the topic. That's what we're gonna be talking about. Everything below here is our supporting details. It has revealed the existence of black holes, massive celestial entities with gravitational poles, so strong that not even light can escape them. Additionally, through astrophysics, scientists have been able to estimate the age of the universe, providing insights into the Big Bang Theory. This field also contributes to the identification of numerous exoplanets, increasing our understanding of potentially life-sustaining planets beyond our solar system. So all of that is our bulk of our supporting details. And then our last sentence is our main idea. Thus, astrophysics continues to expand our knowledge and challenge our understanding of the cosmos. So back to our question, looking at our choices, astrophysics has been instrumental in discovering the speed of light. 
No, we didn't really talk about that. The existence of black holes have been revealed through the study of astrophysics. Yes, that's absolutely something that we talked about. Astrophysics has disproved many traditional theories about the solar system. We can automatically eliminate that. And the study of astrophysics has led to the development of advanced space travel technologies. So based on all of the answers that we have here, we have B being the correct answer. B was something that was specifically stated within the text. And as we talked about before, when we're identifying supporting details, we're going to find them in the same sentence as our topic sentence, and it's going to make up a bulk of the paragraph. Let's take a look at our final question when it comes to this section. Again, we're going to read the question first. Which sentence best summarizes the content of the second paragraph? So we're looking at summary here. So let's take a look at our actual passage. So again, the question is specifically asking about the summary of the second paragraph. So we don't really need to waste our time on that first paragraph. Don't even bother. So as we know with summary, summary is going to be that first sentence of our last paragraph. It's going to surmise everything that we had talked about. So our first sentence states, efforts to mitigate climate change are diverse and include both global and local strategies. So let's go back to our question and see if we have an answer that talks about that. So climate change has far reaching impacts on the environment and human societies. Nope. Efforts to mitigate climate change are diverse and include both global and local strategies. We just literally talked about that. So we know that that is most likely our correct answer, but let's take a look at our last options. Rising global temperatures lead to more frequent and severe weather events and international agreements aim to reduce carbon emissions and limit global warming. So we know that those are not the correct answers. Based on what we read, we know that the correct answer is going to be B. Efforts to mitigate climate change are diverse and include both global and local strategies. So again, just a reminder, when we're identifying summary, we're looking at the first sentence of the last paragraph. Next, we're going to talk about making inferences and logical conclusions. So an inference in drawing a logical conclusion is essentially a conclusion drawn by combining evidence and logical reasoning. Both of these terms are considered the same when you are taking your T's. So in our daily lives, we often unconsciously infer things using cues in our environment to understand various situations. So for instance, you might deduce that a baby is hungry if they are crying, or someone is, was likely speeding if they were pulled over by the police. All of that is based on observations as well as the knowledge that we have. How can we apply that skill and that knowledge with making inferences when it comes to reading. So initially what we want to do is we want to focus on identifying clues, which is the context of our reading. It's going to present within the text as evidence to help us draw our conclusion. Next, we're going to merge these clues with our existing knowledge of what we have previously learned through real world situations. And then the final steps involve synthesizing and formatting that information in order to come up with an idea or an inference. So let's take a look at some examples. Let's take a look at our first practice question. Again, we want to read the question first. Based on the paragraph, what can be inferred about Dr. Baker's perspective on dolphins? So let's read our passage. So Dr. Baker, a renowned marine biologist, has spent the last decade studying the behavioral patterns of dolphins in the wild. Her research conducted off the coast of Hawaii has shown that these intelligent creatures have complex social structures and communication methods. Dr. Baker's observations reveal that dolphins often work together to hunt and protect each other from predators. She has also noted instances of dolphins exhibiting what appears to be playful behavior, engaging with each other and even humans. So let's go back and take a look at our options. So what can we infer based on that passage? She believes that dolphins are solitary creatures. We know that that's not correct. They usually hunt and play within groups. She finds dolphins behavior to be relatively simple. No, nope. we know that she finds it to be complex. She considers dolphins to be highly intelligent and social animals. Absolutely, that's something that she talked about. And she thinks dolphins cannot interact well with humans. Well, as we know, she stated that dolphins can. So the best choice when it comes to this particular question is going to be C. She considers dolphins to be highly intelligent and social 
animals. And again, remember when we're looking at inferences and conclusions, we're drawing them based on the evidence and the reasoning that's found within the text and our prior knowledge. Let's take a look at another example. So our question states, what logical conclusion can be drawn about the future trend of vehicle purchases? So going back to our passage, let's go ahead and read that. In recent years, there has been significant increase in the number of electrical vehicles, EVs, on the road. Automotive manufacturers are investing heavily in EV technology, leading to improvements in battery life and vehicle range. Governments around the world are also supporting this shift with incentives for EV buyers, such as tax rebates and grants. Additionally, public charging infrastructures is becoming more widespread, making it more convenient for EV owners to charge their vehicles. So going back to our question, what can we draw a conclusion based on that paragraph? Is it A, the number of traditional gasoline vehicles are rapidly increasing, B, electric vehicles will become less popular due to high costs, C, electric vehicles are likely to become more prevalent in the automotive market, or D, government incentives for EVs will soon be discontinued. Well, this is a very positive article in regards to the implementation of EV vehicles. So we know that we can automatically eliminate D and we know we can automatically eliminate A because we don't really talk about traditional gasoline vehicles. So electric vehicles will become less popular due to high costs. That's not really something that we talked about, but C is. So electric vehicles are likely to become more prevalent in the automotive market, making C the correct answer for this question. Next, let's talk about explicit and implicit evidence. So when we think of explicit evidence, we think of E for expressed, because explicit evidence is straightforward and it directly is stated in the text. It leaves no room for doubt or interpretation. It's like a direct statement or clear facts. So for instance, consider a sign that reads wet paint. This is an explicit indication that the sign directly informs you that the paint is wet, leaving no room for guesswork, right? So remember, E stands for explicit and expressed. And next we have implicit evidence. So that's our I, the I stands for implied. So when it comes to implied evidence, it's more subtle and it's not directly stated. So instead it's hinted at or it's kind of suggested, requiring you to read between the lines or infer what the meaning is. So an example of this would be seeing a bench that looks like it has paint on it and there's a can and a brush beside it, but there's no sign. There's no explicit statement stating that the bench is wet, but you can infer, right, or imply that it is wet based on the context and the surrounding clues around that bench. So keep in mind when we're thinking about implicit, that I stands for implicit or implied. Let's take a look at some examples of how this is used on the T's. So let's read our question first. Which statement is an example of explicit evidence from the paragraph? So remember, this is gonna be specifically stated in the paragraph. We're not going to have to draw a conclusion or imply what it is. So during a recent lecture on public health, Professor Jenkins discovered the, I'm sorry, discussed the impact of poor air quality on respiratory health. She cited a study that found a significant increase in asthma cases in cities with high levels of air pollution. Professor Jenkins also mentioned that children and the elderly are particularly vulnerable to these effects. She concluded the lecture by emphasizing the need for stricter air quality regulations to protect public health. So let's take a look at our examples. Air pollution might cause discomfort in some people. We didn't really talk about that. That might be just more implied. Asthma cases increase in cities with high levels of air pollution. Absolutely, that was stated inside the text. Well, let's take a look at our final two options. All urban areas have poor air quality. Again, that's not something that we talked about. And air quality regulations are universally strict. Again, not something discussed. So the correct answer for this particular example is going to be B, asthma cases increase in cities with high levels of air pollution. Our next practice question states, what can be implicitly inferred about the protagonist's view on social media? So again, this isn't gonna be directly stated within the text, it's gonna be implicit, meaning that it's going to be implied. So we're gonna to have to draw a logical conclusion about what it is that the author is trying to convey when it comes to social media. So the passage is, in her last novel, 
Author Emily Carter explores themes of isolation and connection in a digital age. The protagonist, a young blogger, struggles with feelings of loneliness despite her large online following. Throughout the story, she navigates the complexities of forming genuine relationships in a world dominated by social media. The novel ends with the protagonist finding solace in a small community of like-minded individuals away from the digital realm. So let's take a look at our examples. She believes social media is the best way to form relationships. Well, we know that's not true because she talks about the feelings of loneliness when it comes to social media. B, she finds greater fulfillment in in-person interactions than online. Well, we can kind of imply that based on the last sentence, right? The novel ends with the protagonist finding solace in a small community of like-minded individuals away from the digital realm. But let's take a look at our final two options. She thinks social media should be avoided at all costs. That's not really something that she talks about, right? And then lastly, she uses social media to increase her popularity. Well, we know that's not true, <laughs> uh, just simply based on the fact that she talks about her feelings of loneliness. So out of all of the options that we have, the most correct answer is going to be B. She finds greater fulfillment in in-person interactions than online. In the last section of this video, we're gonna be talking about comprehension of written directions, starting with transition words and phrases for order and relationship. So a memory trick when it comes to this particular part of the test, transition words can be found at the beginning of a sentence and are usually followed by a comma. There's four key types. We have emphasis, addition, contrast, and order. So starting with emphasis, we have words that we use to highlight something important. Examples of this can be indeed, in fact, most importantly, but I also included additional uh, words that you might wanna be on the lookout. So please feel free to take a screenshot of this particular slide. Next we have addition. So when we talk about addition, these are transition words that are used to wanna add more information to a text. So commonly you're gonna see examples of words like furthermore, additionally, and also. Next we have contrast. So contrast words are used when showing differences or opposing ideas. So think of them as like two different sides of a coin, right? Examples of this can be however, on the other hand, nevertheless. And then lastly, we have order. So with order, these transition words are used as a sequence of ideas or events. And these are ones that we know very well. They're examples of like firstly, subsequently, finally, next, those kinds of words. Let's take a look at some practice test examples of each one of these different kinds of transition words. So taking a look at our first example, the question reads, what transition word in the paragraph is used to emphasize cr a crucial point? So let's take a look. Remember, we're looking for a word with a comma behind it, key tip. So nutrition plays a key role in maintaining good health. Importantly, that's our first word with a comma behind it. A balanced diet provides the body with essential nutrients. This includes vitamins and minerals that support various bodily functions. Regular consumption of fruits and vegetables, for instance, have been linked to the reduced risk of many chronic diseases. So let's take a look at our choices. We have regularly, includes, importantly, and for instance. Well, based on the paragraph that we had, the only uh, transition word that we had was importantly. So we can deduce that the correct answer is going to be C, importantly. Our next example, which transition word in the paragraph indicates the addition of information? Remember, we're looking for those addition words. So global warming is a major environmental concern. It leads to rising sea levels and increased temperatures. Furthermore, it contributes to these frequent and severe weather events like hurricanes and droughts. These changes are, have significant impacts on ecosystems and human societies. So we have leads, furthermore, like, and these. Based on our paragraph here, we have furthermore with a comma behind it. That is the only transition word that we have in this paragraph. So worst case scenario, if you were unable to figure out, oh, I can't remember what the addition word is, look for those words at the beginning of a sentence with a comma behind it. So based on all the choices that we have, the correct answer is going to be B, furthermore. That is our addition transition word. Our next example, the question reads, which transition word in the paragraph 
introduces a contrasting idea. Remember, that's that both sides of the coin kind of contrast uh, transition word. So taking a look at our paragraph, exercise is known to be beneficial for health. Alternatively, comma, there's our transition word, a sedentary lifestyle is associated with various health risks, including obesity and heart disease. The contrast between an active or a sedentary lifestyle highlights the importance of regular physical activity for maintaining good health. So let's take a look at our options. No, that's not a transition word, right? Alternatively, absolutely. Including, that's usually like an addition, right? And then highlights, no. So based on all of the options that we have here, the best option is going to be B, alternatively. Let's take a closer look at our final question. So which transition word in the paragraph is used to indicate the next sequence of events? So we're looking for something that is related to next, okay, when it comes to transition words. So let's take a look at our paragraph. In the process of photosynthesis, plants convert sunlight into energy. First, comma, so here's our first transition word. They absorb sunlight using chlorophyll in their leaves. Second, comma, they use this energy to convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. This process is essential for the growth of plants and for producing oxygen in the environment. So again, the question states, which transition word in the paragraph is used to indicate the next sequence of events? So we have convert, we know that's not right. First is definitely one of our order transition words. Second, again, another one of our order transition words, and essential. So remember, this is when you really need to read that question. It's indicating the next sequence of events. So while first is a transition word, the correct answer is actually C. C is second, that is our second sentence. Second, we use energy to convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. That is indicating our next sequence of events when we're looking at an order of events. Now that we've become very familiar with transition words with order, we have priorities and direction. They're kind of like the same thing. You're looking for those transition words. So you're gonna be provided with a list with bullets or a number priority. So you're gonna look for words like first, second, third, fourth, or you can even be looking for things like first, additionally, next, and finally. So let's take a look at our example. I have highlighted those words for you. As a nursing student, Sarah has developed a structured approach to manage her study sessions effectively. First, there's our first word, she reviews her lecture notes to reinforce the material covered in class. Next, there's our second one, she tackles practice questions related to these topics to enhance her understanding and application skills. Additionally, there's our third one, Sarah allocates time to participate in study groups where she discusses complex concepts with her peers. Finally, there's our last one. She indicates the last part of her study session by reviewing difficult topics and sharing the comprehensive grasp of materials before her exams. Let's take a look at some practice questions so we can kind of grasp what we're looking for when it comes to priorities and directions. Taking a look at our practice question, according to Julia's study plan, which two activities are planned to be done together? Remember, we're looking for those addition transition words to combine two topics together. So taking a look at our paragraph, to prepare for the upcoming nursing certification exam, Julia outlined a detailed study plan. First, she decided to review all of her class notes to refresh her fundamental knowledge. Second, she planned to take several additional tests to identify areas where she needed more focus. Additionally, during this phase, Julia intended to join online forums and discussion groups to gain deeper insight into challenging topics. And finally, she would dedicate the last week before the exam to revising her weakest subjects, ensuring thorough preparation. So let's take a look at our options here. So we already found our transition word. Did you find it? Yes, it's additionally. So those are the two topics that we're combining together. First, we have reviewing class notes and taking practice tests. Well, that was our first one. And our second one, those we were not combining together, right? First, second, that's our sequence of events. B, joining online forums and revising weakest subjects. Again, 
that was our third to last and our last. We're not combining those together because we have that transition word in between finally. So that separates them. Taking practice tests and joining online forums. Yep, that's in between our transition word additionally. So those two things would be what we're combining together. But let's look at our final option. Refreshing fundamental knowledge and revising weakest subjects. Again, that is the last sentence of our paragraph. It's not combining anything. So based on all of the options that we have available to us, the correct answer is going to be C, taking practice tests and joining online forums. Let's take a look at our final section for this video, and that is missing information and contraindications. So when we're looking at these questions, we wanna scan for gaps and statements that contradict against actions. So for missing information, we want to make sure that we're skimming the passage to grasp the main idea. Remember, that's the last sentence of our first paragraph. We want to identify what specific information the question is trying to seek. And lastly, we want to look for gaps in that explanation. When it comes to contraindications, we're, we really need to understand what it is that the text is trying to convey. Is it medical? Is it mechanical? What is it trying to tell us? We want to identify any mentioned conditions, situations, or factors that we're going to see in the text. And then lastly, we want to look for statements that advise against certain actions. So let's take a look at some practice questions so we can tie this all together. So starting with our question first, we have what crucial aspect of heart health maintenance is missing from Dr. Ellis's seminar? Looking at our passage, we have in a recent public health seminar, Dr. Ellis discussed the impact of lifestyle choices on heart health. She covered the benefits of regular exercise and a balanced diet. However, during her talk, she realized that she hadn't addressed the crucial aspect of heart health maintenance. Despite this omission, she emphasized the importance of avoiding smoking and reducing stress. So taking a look at our examples, we have the importance of regular exercise. Well, she did talk about the benefits of regular exercise, so we can get rid of that option. The benefits of a balanced diet. Again, she did cover that topic, so we can automatically eliminate that. We have the role of medication and heart health. That wasn't really something that she discussed, so we can keep that one on the back burner. And then lastly, D, the importance of avoiding smoking. Well, based on our very last sentence, our main idea, she did emphasize the importance of avoiding smoking. So based on all of the options that we have available to us, the correct answer is going to be C, the role of medications and heart health. Taking a look at our next question, we have what contraindication does Dr. Nguyen advise against for her patient? So we're looking for something that Dr. Nguyen says, do not do this. So let's take a look at our example. During a consultation, Dr. Nguyen advised her patient who has a history of chronic kidney disease about managing hypertension. She prescribed a specific blood pressure medication, but cautious, cautioned against, that's that word we're looking for, against the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, also known as NSAIDs, for pain relief, noting their potential for worsening kidney function. So let's take a look at our question examples. So we have A, taking prescribed blood pressure medication. Well, that's something that she did advise to do, right? Engaging in high intensity exercise. Well, that wasn't something we talked about at all in this paragraph, so we can eliminate that. Consuming a high protein diet. Again, didn't really discuss diet, we were more focused on medications. And then lastly, using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, also known as NSAIDs. She did caution against using these drugs for pain relief because they can worsen kidney function. So based on all of the options that we have available to us, the correct answer is going to be D, using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We're gonna begin by locating specific information in the text. We wanna find relevant information that's within that text asking us what problem are we trying to solve or what decision am I trying to make? In order to identify this, we usually follow one of four steps. So step one is you want to read the question first. As always, specifically when it comes to reading, you want to read the question first. Step two, you wanna find the passages, topic sentence, and main idea. Remember that topic sentence is usually that first sentence of the paragraph, 
and the main idea is the last sentence of that paragraph. Step three, you wanna read that supporting detail. So carefully read through the details that follow that topic sentence. Focus on how these details expand upon or explain that main idea. And you wanna pay attention to examples, facts, statistics, or anecdotes that are used to support that main idea as well. And then lastly, with step four, is there anything that's missing? Or is there any information that maybe is considered irrelevant to the topic or the main idea? So we wanna evaluate whether all of that information that we read is really conclu conclusive to what the topic is talking about. We wanna look for gaps in logical reasoning as well as areas that maybe need additional information. We wanna identify any details or elements um, that do not directly relate to the main idea or seem to be out of place. And then we want to determine if the provided information thoroughly and effectively supports the main idea. So let's take a look at an example. So starting with reading our question first, it asks what factor mentioned in the study significantly disrupts sleep cycles in adults? So we're looking at what is disrupting our sleep cycle as adults. So starting with our topic sentence, in a recent study on sleep patterns, researchers discovered several factors that affect the quality of sleep in adults. Here's our supporting details. The study emphasized the role of a consistent sleep schedule and the impact of electronic devices on sleep quality. It was found that exposure to blue lights from screens before bedtime significantly disrupts sleep cycles. However, the study did not elaborate on the effects of dietary habits of sleep, focusing primarily on environmental and behavioral factors. Here's our main idea. The researchers suggested further investigation of non-environmental factors that could influence sleep quality. So let's take a look at our options. Inconsistent sleep schedules. So that's not really something in regards to specific information that we're looking at when it comes to disrupting sleep cycles in adults. Dietary habits, as the paragraph said, it did not talk about the effects of dietary habits, so we can eliminate that. Exposure, exposure of blue lights from screens. We absolutely talked about that and how that affects our sleep cycles. And then use of traditional light sources, again, not something that was discussed. So based out of all of the options, the correct answer that we are going to be looking at is going to be C, exposure of blue lights from screens when it comes to identifying the information in this text. So I'm gonna be off screen for this one so that you can get the entirety of the screen. But this is one of my favorite parts of the T's is glossaries, indexes, and table of contests because they're so easy to answer. So starting with glossaries that we have over here, the definition of a glossary is a list of terms and their definitions typically related to a specific subject or field. You're usually gonna find these at the end of a textbook or at a study guide, and the main purpose is really to help you understand specific terminology when it comes to the T's. Next, we have indexes. So an index is an alphabetical list of names, subjects, with references to places where they occur, typically found at the end of the book. So as we said, that location is usually found at the very end of the textbook or the study material, and it's to help you quickly find information on a particular topic or keyword that's found in the text. And then lastly, we have table of contents. So the table of contents is a list of chapters, sections, and often is the major subsections within them. So again, this is found at the beginning, the very beginning of your textbook or your study guide, and it's really to provide an overview of the structure and the main topics covered in that material, helping you navigate through the actual text instead of wasting your time trying to find information about specific chapters. So let's take a look at some practice questions. So starting with our first practice question, which of the following definitions correctly describes a bar graph? So we have A, a diagram showing the relationship between two variables using a line. B, the, uh, the graph that represents data visually using bars of different heights or lengths. C, a circular chart divided into sectors illustrating numerical proportions. Or D, a collection of dots on a graph representing values of two variables. So we're gonna take a look over here at our example. We're gonna look for bar graphs. 
So we see here bar graphs, a graph that represents data visually using bars of different heights or lengths. So we're going back here, we're trying to figure out what the correct definition is, and we can see that B is going to be the correct answer. It's a graph that represents data visually using bars of different heights or lengths. So taking a look at our next practice question, if you're looking for information on Amazon bestsellers in a book about online marketplaces, which of the following pages should you refer to? So over here to the right of the screen, we have our index. So we're gonna move down our index and find the information that we need. We're looking for Amazon bestsellers. Look, here we have Amazon, so we're getting close. Oh, and right below it, we have Amazon bestsellers. What's interesting about the T's is they are going to try to trip you up. So it's very important that you make sure you read that question, understand specifically what it's looking for. While Amazon is listed here, it's not the correct answer. We're looking for Amazon bestsellers. So based on our index, that's going to be between pages 79 and 82. Looking over here at our options, what is the best option? We do have the correct answer is going to be A. Amazon bestsellers is going to be on the pages of 79 to 82. And for our last question, we have a table of contents question. So in any research method textbook, where would you find information about the results of an experiment based on the table of contents? So let's take a look over here at our table of contents. So we have the abstract, dedication, acknowledgement, preface, a list of tables, figures, and schemes. Here we have some chapters. So chapter one is gonna be the introduction. Chapter two is gonna be method. Oh. Look right here, chapter three, we have results. So the question is about information about the results of an experiment based on the table of contents. So we have chapter three and we know that it is on page 18. So we're gonna look over here at our options. Do we have it? Yes, absolutely we do. The correct answer is gonna be A, chapter three, page 18. So let's talk about headings and subheadings. So when it comes to headings, this is the title at the head of a page or a document. So it's going to introduce that main topic or theme that's gonna be written in the passage. And then when it comes to our subheadings, that's gonna be the headings underneath that main heading that provides those additional details. So it's gonna break down that main topic into more specific areas or aspects. So let's take a look at an example of what this would look like. So here's an example of our headings and subheadings. So our headings are gonna be in the red color and our subheadings is gonna be in more of our teal color. So a guide to mastering the barbecue. So that is our main heading, right? That is what all of this is about. And then we start to see our subheadings. So remember, this is that additional information about our main heading, our main idea. So choosing the right grill, right? Absolutely, we need to know how to choose that. It's very important. And then we have another subheading, essential grilling tools. So we have the right grill. We're gonna have to have the tools, right? That is that next additional information underneath our main heading. Let's take a closer look with some practice questions. So I wanna make something very clear when it comes to the T's. Sometimes the questions are not going to ask you to identify headings and subheadings. They're gonna require you to come up with them yourself. So I wanted to give you a little bit of the harder examples because as we could see from the previous example, it was really easy to tell what was a heading and what was a subheading. But in this particular case, I want you to be able to identify what could be a good heading or subheading. So let's take a look at our first example. What is the best heading for the above passage? So remember, this is the main idea of the passage. So sleep plays a critical role in maintaining overall health and well-being. It aids in memory consolidation, muscle repair, and regulation of hormones that control growth and appetite. Poor sleep patterns are linked to various health issues, including obesity, heart disease, and depression. The importance of consistent sleep schedules and creating a conducive sleep environment are also discussed. So these are our options when it comes to identifying what would be a good heading. So nutrition and health wasn't really something that we talked about, that really the topic sentence is more related to sleep. The importance of exercise. Well, we didn't really talk about that either, right? We talked about issues that could be related to the overall health and well-being when it comes to sleep. C, understanding sleep and health. This sounds great, right? That sounds exactly like what we talked about in this paragraph. And mental health awareness. We did talk about depression, but it wasn't really the main focus of the passage. So based on all of the options that we have, the most correct answer is going to be C, 
understanding sleep and health. For our next question, it states, which of the following should be the best subheading for the section of the text? Remember, that's adding additional information. It's not what the main idea is about. It's just that additional piece. It's those supporting details. So the paragraph is, the relationship between dietary choices and heart health is a critical area of study in preventative medicine. That is our topic. This section delves into certain types of fats and cholesterol levels influence the risk of developing heart disease. It also discusses the importance of antioxidants found in fruits and vegetables for maintaining a healthy cardiovascular system. So we're looking for those supporting details, those important subheadings. So we have diet and cardiovascular health. Yes, absolutely, those are two of the things that they talk about. So those could be our subheadings. We also have exercise and heart disease prevention. Well, it wasn't really something that was discussed within this text, so we can automatically eliminate that. Managing stress for heart health. I think that's really important, and you do need to manage your stress, but it wasn't something that was explicitly stated within the passage. And then lastly, impacts of sleep when it comes to cardiovascular system. Again, not really something that we talked about. So based out of all of the options that we have available to us, the correct answer is going to be A, diet and cardiovascular health. Next, let's talk about one of my personal favorites, and that's sidebars, underline bold and italicized text, footnotes, and legends. These are super easy to answer. So starting with sidebars, these are those short pieces of text are usually found alongside the margins of the main text, and they provide additional information, clarification, or examples relevant to the main text. Next, we have underline text. So this is where they draw a little line underneath a specific word, and it can appear anywhere within the body. And it's often used to indicate some kind of importance or highlight significant terms, sometimes even used for hyperlinks when you're looking at digital text. Next, we have bolded text. So bolded texts are usually darker and thicker than their surrounding text. And again, they're found anywhere within that main body. They're used to emphasize keywords, headings, making them stand out and easier to identify. Next, we have italicized text, and this is kind of that slanted to the right kind of text. Um, again, it appears in the main body, and it's used to emphasize, to denote titles of work, or to highlight foreign words or even phrases. Next, we have footnotes. Footnotes are additional information and citations found at the bottom of the page. Um, it's usually located in the footer, and there's usually a reference number attached to it in order to identify what it is referencing. And then lastly, we have legends. So when it comes to legends, that's that explanatory information. It's key for understanding the figures, tables, as well as maps. And they're usually found below or beside that figure table or map, depending on what it is that you're looking at. So let's take a look at some practice questions to put all of this together. So as always, we want to read our question first. So according to the sidebar in the Healthy Eating Patterns chapter of Modern Nutrition, what type of content is featured? So when we're taking a look at this particular practice question, we don't even have to look at the passage itself. We're simply looking at what's down here, which is our sidebar. So let's take a look. It says experiences. Maria, who after switching to the Mediterranean diet, saw remarkable improvements in her cholesterol levels and overall heart health. Another story is about John, who managed to control his type 2 diabetes and reduce his medication significantly by adhering to this diet. So going back to our question, according to the sidebar in the Healthy Eating Patterns chapter of Modern Nutrition, what type of content is featured? So we have statistical data on the popularity of different diets. Well, we know that's not true. It didn't talk about that at all. We have B, personal accounts related to the Mediterranean diet. Absolutely, we had two examples of where that was featured. C, X, scientific explanation of diet benefits. Didn't really talk about that. And then lastly, D, recipes related to healthy eating patterns. There was no recipes there at all. So based on our conclusion with what we read in that sidebar, we know that the correct answer is going to be B, personal accounts related to the Mediterranean diet. Our next practice question, in the context of the provided passage, what does the bolded term biodiversity refer to? So let's take a look at our passage. In the study of eco ecosystems, the concept of biodiversity is fundamental. Biodiversity refers to the variety of life in a particular habitat or ecosystem. That is our definition right there. It tells us specifically what it is about. 
So going back to our practice question options, we have a protection of natural habitats. No, nope, doesn't talk about that. B, the variety of life in a specific area or ecosystem. Yes, that is the correct answer based on that sentence that refers to what the specific definition is. But let's look at our last two options. The process of species becoming extinct, didn't even talk about that, and the climate and weather patterns of an ecosystem. No. So based on all of the options that we have available to us, we were able to answer this question quickly and deduce that B, the variety of life in a specific area or ecosystem is the correct answer. Next, let's talk about common elements of graphs as well as maps. So you're going to have different things that you're going to have to be able to identify. They being title, labels on the X and Y axes, scale, and legend. So let's break each one of these down. So first we have title. So the title of the graph gives that concise description about what the graph is specifically about. You're usually gonna find it always at the top of your graph and it's gonna help you identify what the main topic and focus is. Then we have the label for our X and Y axis. So these labels describe what each axis represents. So our X axis is going to be horizontal and our Y axis is gonna be on the other side and it's going to be vertical. Next we have scale. So a scale is a graph that indicates the units of measure and the value each increment of the axis that it represents. So if you take a look over here, this is your scale. This is what is breaking down specifically how uh, big something is, how small something is, what the population is in this particular case. It's going to give you a unit of measure. And then lastly, you're gonna have legends. So a legend is that explanatory information or key of understanding figures, tables that are gonna be found on the map. So let's take a look at some practice questions to kind of break this down and what the T's might specifically ask you. Starting with our first question, according to the map of Los Angeles, California, what is the distance in kilometers between Torrance and Compton? So if you take a look here, you have two different kinds of distances. So this is where the T's is going to mess you up. So you have kilometers and you have miles. So this particular question is asking about kilometers. So what I usually do is I'll take like a little piece of paper. I know it's kind of hard to see, but I'll line it up with the actual graph that is on the T's. And I'll usually make like a little line and this is my zero kilometers. As I'm measuring out, here's another little line in the middle that would be about 10. And then we have another little line here at the end and that is 20 kilometers. And I take that and I actually lay it on top of my graph to kind of get what it is that I'm trying to figure out. So I'm trying to figure out the kilometers. What is the distance between these two points on a map? So if you take a look, the distance between Torrance and Compton, it's a little bit more than 10 kilometers, right? We know that this middle line right here is 10 uh, kilometers, but it's not quite 20, right? We're not quite at 20 kilometers. So when we're taking a look at our answers and we're trying to make the best educated guess, we know that eight kilometers is incorrect. That would be kind of on this side. Then we have 10 kilometers. Well, we know it's not 10 because it's a little bit more than that. We have 20 kilometers. Again, that would have to be all the way at the end of our little scale here. So we know that's not correct. So lastly, we have 12. It's a little bit more than 10, not quite 20. The only answer out of everything that we have to make our best educated guess would be D, 12 kilometers. So our next question states, according to the graph, how many sales did the North Division make in 2023? So we're gonna take a look at our graph here. So we have different color variations, right? We have a blue, we have a red, we have a teal, and we have a purple. And we have a little key up here that's telling us which color corresponds to which division. So based on our question, we're looking for the North Division. So we know we're gonna be looking at blue. But we also have a breakdown in years here, right? We have 2021, 2022, and 2023. So again, we're looking for North Division in 2023. So we're gonna be looking at blue here at the end of our graph, and we're gonna just kind of best guesstimate how many sales that they made. So based on this, if we were to follow this line over, it looks like they made about 20,000 sales. So based on all of the options that we have available to us here, our best educated guess is going to be that the North Division made about 20,000 sales in 2023. Let's talk about biased and misleading information when it comes to graphics. So graphics like charts, graphs, maps, and tables are going to be powerful tools for presenting data and information. However, 
They can sometimes be used to convey bias or misleading information, whether it's intentional or unintentional. There are key things that you're going to need to be able to identify. So starting here with our manipulating scale. The scale of a graph can be manipulated to exaggerate or downplay certain data trends. So for instance, a graph may show a steep rise uh, or it might show a steep fall by using a compressed scale or it might minimize significant changes by using an expanded scale. So if you take a look here, based on this, they say increasing sales every year and they have this steep rise that's taking place. But if you take a look here, you can see that it's kind of back and forth, right? So we were doing really good up to 1940, 1950, somehow the scales went down. Then in 1960, they went back up. But then look at this, 1970, 1980, they were kind of down again. Uh, 1990 and then 2000s, it came back up. And then in 2010, they went back down again. So again, this is manipulating the scale to make it appear that the data trend is increasing every single year. And then we have selective data presentation. So picking selective data to support a specific narrative while omitting contradictory data can be used to skew a presentation. So if we take a look at this graph, we have nursing bedside shortage from 2020 to 2025. So if we take a look, we have uh, 2020 about 100%, 2021 it increases, increases in 2022, further increases in 2023. Then we have a massive increase in 2024, and then it's just gonna continuously increase as we see over the years. But what's interesting about this argument is it doesn't talk about the bedside nurses that still hold their license that are just not working at the bedside anymore. So certain graphs are going to prevent selective data in order to really push their argument forward. So it's really important that when you're looking at graphs that you're being critical of the information that you're seeing and look for sources that either confirm or deny that information. Some additional bias or misleading graphs that you might see is misrepresenting correlations. So graphs can imply correlations or causations between variables that may not exist or may be more complex that's actually represented. So if you look here, we have home interest rates over the last five years. If you were to look at this, you would say, wow, they've maintained 5% since from 2019 to 2023. But all of a sudden in 2024, they're going up 7%. What was up with that huge increase between the last several years until this year? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Sometimes individuals might use graphs like this to misrepresent or to bias you into purchasing something stating, oh, well, if you don't do it now, it's gonna go up the next year. So you have to be really critical when you're looking at these kind of graphs when it comes to the T's. And then lastly, we have inappropriate graph types. When we're using graphs that aren't suitable to the kind of data that we have, we're gonna distort the viewer's overall understanding of what we're trying to represent. So if you take a look here, we have temperature changes in 2023. They've used a circle graph for some reason, right? Why am I using a circle graph when it comes to temperature changes? If I'm looking at this, it's not really telling me how those temperatures have varied over the year. So to me, this would have made much more sense to actually put it in a line graph as opposed to a circle graph. So really, again, be hypercritical of the graphs you see. Let's take a look at some practice questions to break this down. So practice question one, we have a bar graph displays a company's annual sales from 1900 to 2020 and states that each year the sales have increased. How does the bar graph mislead regarding the company's sales trends from 1900 to 2020? By omitting sales data for certain years. Well, if we take a look here, we have a pretty consistent decade for each bar graph. So we can automatically eliminate that by showing but I'm sorry, by incorrectly showing a continuous increase in sales each year. Well, yes, absolutely. As we can see, we have dips in some of these years. So that is absolutely misleading. By using a bar graph instead of a line graph, well, we could have used a line graph as well, um, but that's not really what's misleading. By not showing sales figures for the year of 1990. So again, we do have sales figures for 1990. So based on all of the options that we have available to us, the only correct answer that makes sense would be B. By correctly showing a continuous increase in sales for each 
here. And lastly, when it comes to the topics of graphs, let's talk about how they can actually strengthen arguments. So as we know, gr graphs are really great tools when it comes to enhancing persuasiveness and clarity of a point being made. They provide visual data that can immediately convey trends, comparisons, and relationships that might not be as obvious as we would see with textual descriptions. So for example, a well-designed graph can distinctly show the increase in graduate nurse turnover variability over time, making it easier for the audience to grasp and remember the key arguments. So if you take a look at this graph, graduate nurse turnover rates from 2019 to 2023. So in 2019, prior to the COVID pandemic, the turnover rates weren't really large, right? But as we start to get into the COVID pandemic, look at how much they skyrocketed, right? 30, 40, well, I should say 30, like 35, almost 40%. And then in 2023, it was right at 40%, just a little bit above. So when we have hospital administrators that are trying to make an argument regarding the screening processes, when it comes to graduate nurses, or maybe trying to implement programs for retention to lessen these numbers, graphs really can be helped with that persuasive aspect of trying to get their point across so that they can develop things like programs and better screening tools to help maintain graduate nurses within the field. Let's talk about words or phrases when it comes to sequence of events. We talked about this in a previous video, but it is gonna to be touched upon um, several times throughout the TEAS exam. So transition words and phrases for sequence of events. They're broken down by these categories. So we have before, first, next, sometimes, and last. So starting with before, this is things that are gonna happen in the past. So we're gonna be looking at words like earlier, beforehand, in the past, this morning, things that happened in the past. Next we have first. So these are the initial steps when it comes to sequence of events. So you're gonna see transition words like in the beginning, to begin with, first, firstly, originally, those are the ones that you're going to see for first. Next we have next. So that's going to start after a step, right? So we have first, something happens first, and then we're going to have things like next. It's going to be the second things that happen. So you're going to see transition words like second, soon after, afterwards, then, later, those types of words. Then we have sometimes. So sometimes are transition words that happen at irregular intervals. There's not really a like a set time that these things happen. So you're gonna see transition words like every so often, occasionally, at times, from time to time, rarely. It's something that's really irregular and it isn't very consistent. And then our last transition word is of course, last. And that is the final point that we're making in regards to a passage. So you're gonna see transition words like finally, lastly, and conclusion to conclude ultimately overall. So these are really the the bulk of words that you're gonna see in the ATITs, really make sure that you've honed in on these words and that you understand them because it will be important when you're taking your test. So taking a look at our practice question, the question states, based on the passage, what does the phrase every now and then suggest about Sarah's discoveries of cafes and bookstores? So this is a classic example of where you don't really need to re read the passage because the question is specifically asking what it is that you need to know. So if you wanna read the passage, we will, but in this particular case, you wouldn't have to. So the passage states in her diary, Sarah chronicled her experiences as a new resident in the bustling city. She noted, but every now and then she would discover a quaint little cafe tucked away in a corner of a charming bookstore hidden down an alley. These sporadic discoveries brought her immense joy in her urban explorations. So again, we're looking at what that every now and then phrase means. So we have a couple options here. We have she finds them regularly and predictable. Nope. If it's every now and then, we're not looking at something that is consistent or predictable, so we can automatically eliminate that. We have B. She comes across them continuously and without interruption. We just talked about that. This is not a continuous transition word, so we know that B is the incorrect answer. Then we have C. She stumbles upon them occasionally and at irregular intervals. Yes, every now and then does not give us any kind of consistency or predictability, so C Sounds like it would be the correct answer, but let's look at our final option. And then D, she found them once and never again. Well, that's not true because she states every now and then. So she finds them here, she finds them there at irregular intervals. So based on all of the options we have available to us, the correct answer is going to be C. She stumbles upon them occasionally and at 
regular, irregular, I'm sorry, intervals. Rounding out our transition words, we have transition words and phrases with cohesion of events. So we're looking at things like when, how often, and length of time. So starting with when, that is our timing. So when we're looking at things like then, that's gonna indicate what happens next in a sequence. Or if we're looking at a transition word like at this moment, it's gonna show action that's happening at a specific point in time. Next we have how often, so this is our frequency. So if we're looking at transition words like occasionally, we can suggest that an event happens from time to time, but it's not regular. And then with frequently, this is the complete opposite. It means that this event happens quite often in comparison to occasionally, right? And then lastly, we have length of time. So this is how long something has taken place. So if we use a transition word like temporarily, it's going to describe an action or event that's gonna eventually stop, right? It's just temporary. It's not gonna continuously keep happening. Whereas with the transition word permanently, this is going to imply a state or condition that's going to last indefinitely. So you see how we can use transition words to make a completely different meaning depending on what we're looking at when it comes to cohesions of events? Well, let's take a look at some practice questions to kind of help build upon this even further. This question states, according to the biologist's notes, what does occasionally apply about the frequency of spotted red-tailed hawks? So for this one, let's eliminate reading the passage and see if we can figure it out. So we have the word occasionally, which means that it happens from time to time, but it's not very consistent. So we have A, the hawks are observed continuously. We know that that's incorrect because it's occasionally, it's gonna happen from time to time. So we can eliminate that. B, the hawks were observed rarely. Mm, that could potentially be the answer, so let's keep that in our back pocket, but let's move on to the next one. C, the hawks were observed at regular intervals. We know that's incorrect. Consistency, regular, that's not what we're talking about when we use the transition word occasionally. And then lastly, we have D, the hawks are observed sporadically. So again, that's that time to time, sporadically, occasionally, they all fit within that category of our transition words. So based on what we have without reading the passage and just solely reading the question to save ourselves time, we know that the correct answer is going to be D, the hawks were observed sporadically. And this is the last section of this video. We're gonna be talking about drawing conclusions and identifying gaps. So drawing conclusions and identifying gaps is the sequence of events that involve an understanding of like a chronological order of events and recognizing when information is going to be missing or implied that we have to kind of make up ourselves. So an inference and drawing conclusion, remember we talked about them before, they're both used interchangeably, is essentially drawing a conclusion from combining evidence and logical reasoning. So when it comes to identifying gaps, we need to kind of follow this kind of timeline. So you have to understand the timeline. Carefully read the text to understand the chronological order of events and make sure you pay attention to those transition words that we went heavily into. Those are first, then, subsequently, finally, make sure that you're following those words. You wanna identify key events. So you wanna note the main events in that sequence. This can be done by highlighting or jotting down brief notes about what's happening within that mentioned text. And then you wanna look for causal relationships. Determine if there is a cause and effect relationship between events. Understand why an event occurred that can actually help you in drawing a conclusion about subsequent events that might happen afterwards. You wanna detect those gaps by looking for context clues. Be alert to any gaps that are gonna be happening within that sequence. A gap can be an event that is not fully explained or they could just jump somewhere into the future without having talked about what was happening during present day. Uh, sometimes the information about the event is not explicitly stated, it's gonna be more implied. So you're gonna to have to use your past experiences to kind of try to figure out what's missing. And then lastly, we have evaluate event outcomes. So we wanna assess the outcomes of an event. We wanna understand the results of each event and can provide insights to that sequence to help us draw those conclusions and the overall narrative or the argument that the author is trying to convey. Let's take a look at some practice questions of what this will look like on your test. Starting with question one, what important step is missing in the chocolate cake Baking process is outlined in the cookbook. So we're looking for a missing step out of all the steps that we have in order to bake this cake. So let's take a look at our steps. To bake a chocolate cake, the following steps are outlined in the cookbook. Number one, gather all necessary ingredients, including flour, sugar, cocoa, baking powder, eggs, milk, and oil. So that sounds good. 
Number two, we want to preheat the oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, fantastic. Three, in a large bowl, we're going to mix together the flour, sugar, cocoa, and baking powder. So we're mixing together all of our dry ingredients. Number four, in a separate bowl, we're going to beat the eggs and then add milk and oil. So that's all of our wet ingredients. Five, we're going to combine the wet and dry ingredients and stir until the mixture is smooth. And then number seven, look, oh, look at that. It looks like we're missing step six, right? Number seven, let the cake cool in a wire rack after baking. So we're obviously missing something in between five and seven. So let's figure out what that is. So frosting the cake, well, that would probably happen after the cake is cool. So while it is missing, it's not something that's missing within our steps that were provided. We have B, baking the cake in the preheated oven. Well, if you take a look, it doesn't really tell us how long that cake needs to be baked, right? So that could absolutely be the potential answer. Uh, we have C, serving the cake. Again, that's something that's gonna happen after all of these sequence of events. So it's not something that's missing from our instructions. And then D, washing the mixing bowls. While that is very important, after you bake a cake, it's not necessarily something that's missing. So in this particular case, the correct answer is going to be B, baking the cake in the preheated oven. It doesn't give us specifically how long we need to bake that cake, so that would be a critical piece of information that we're missing from this text. So we're gonna start with author's point of view. So when we read, we're not just looking at words on a page, right? We're stepping into the author's world, seeing it through their eyes. But guess what? Their viewpoint can dramatically shape the story. But how does that happen? That's what we're gonna talk about in this particular section. So imagine that we have two people looking at the exact same house. One coming from a middle-class background might see their dream home, right? And the other who's accustomed to luxury might dismiss this as a mere shack. Fascinating, right? It's the same house, but their perspectives paint totally different pictures. This is exactly what happens in writing. An author's background, experiences, and beliefs color their narrative. It's not just about what they say, but it's how they say it. And that can really reveal a lot about what the author's stances are on various topics. Let's take a look at a practice question of what we're talking about. So the question states, what point of view does the author express in this passage? So the passage states, growing up in a small coastal town has always influenced my view of the ocean. To me, it represents freedom and a connection to nature that city life simply cannot offer. The sea is not just a body of water. It's a vital part of our community's identity and tradition, something that urban environments often lack. So our options are A, an objective analysis of the differences between coastal and urban environments, maybe. B, a preference for coastal life over city life based on personal and cultural experiences. Yeah, absolutely, they do talk about that. C, a factual comparison of the environmental impact of coastal and urban areas. Or D, an unbiased report on living conditions in different geographical locations. So based on all the options that we have available to us, the most correct answer is going to be B, a preference for coastal life over city life based on personal and cultural experiences. So as we stated before, the author's point of view is influenced by their personal experiences of growing up in a coastal town. This passage that we just read reflects that bias towards being part of that coastal lifestyle, emphasizing that deep connection to the ocean and viewing that as a symbol of freedom as well as community identity. Having been raised in a multicultural city, I've experienced the richness of diverse cultures firsthand. This has led me to believe that cultural diversity is essential for a vibrant and dynamic society. Cities that lack this diversity tend to be monotonous and less innovative in comparison. So let's take a look at our options. A neutral observation on the effects of cultural diversity in cities. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't think that's what they're talking about here. An analytical study of urban development in relation to cultural diversity. We don't really talk about that at all, so we can automatically eliminate that. An impartial overview of different societal structures in urban areas. While they do talk about diversity, they don't talk about the specific structures, so we can automatically eliminate C. And then lastly, we have D, a belief in the superiority of multicultural environments based on personal upbringing. To me, 
That one makes the most sense, so the correct answer is going to be D, a belief in the superiority of multicultural environments based on personal upbringings. So again, this is based on someone's personal point of view. That is what is influencing that writing. So this author reflects that bias towards those multicultural environments shaped by their personal experience of being raised in a diverse city. Next, let's talk about first, second, and third person point of view. So when we're talking about this, we're really trying to figure out who is telling the story and from what perspective are some of the most important choices that the author is making. So for example, if a story is told in a different point of view, it can entirely change the story altogether. So let's imagine the classic Rapunzel. We all know this story, right? So depending on who is narrating it, the prince, Rapunzel, or an outsider, the tale is going to look entirely different. First, let's start with the first person point of view where Rapunzel herself is telling the story. She could say something like, ouch, climb faster, will you? You're hurting me. Imagine Rapunzel's pain and impatience in the first person as the prince is struggling to climb up her hair. It's a completely different story, right? Now we have second person. So imagine that you are telling the story about Rapunzel. You are Rapunzel. So in this instance, you can say, you hear a voice below. Your heart races as you approach the window. Let down your hair, he calls. You hesitate. Then release your braided locks, feeling a tangle of excitement and fear. Finally, let's look at it from third person point of view. And this is usually how we're accustomed to hearing fairy tales, as they're usually told by narrators. So in this example, let's say the narrator states, Rapunzel, locked away in her tower, watched the world from above. Each day was the same until a prince, enchanted by her voice, discovered her. He called to her, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair. And she cautiously, curiously, complied. You see how this, all three of these completely changed the story? That's what we're talking about when we're trying to figure out first, second, and third person point of views. Let's take a look at our first examples. So the question states, which point of view is used in this passage? So the passage states, in my years as a teacher, I've seen the impact of individualized attention on student success. I believe that when educators tailor, tailor their approach to each student's needs, the results are significantly more positive. So looking at our keywords, we're seeing a lot of I, right? It's being told by that person. It's that first person point of view. So out of all of our answers that we have here, the best one is going to be first person A. Let's take a look at another example. Which point of view is used in this passage? So again, we're looking for those key words. So Dr. Ellis holds the view that early intervention is crucial for the treatment of chronic diseases. She advocates for her proactive health screenings, arguing that this approach can lead to better health outcomes. So looking here, looking at those keywords, we're seeing words like she, right? So we know that it's not being told from the first person. We can automatically eliminate that. There is no you, yours, any of those words. So we can automatically eliminate the second person, but we are seeing keywords like she, her, things like that. So we can deduce that based on this particular passage, it is being told from the point of view of third person. The answer, correct answer is C. Next, we're going to move on to author's tone. So the tone is basically the author's attitude towards the subject and the author expresses this tone through the use of different adjectives. So the tone can be judgmental, bias, it can even be emotional. It can also be positive, negative, and neutral. So these are some of the words that you're gonna see used on your T's exam. So when we're looking at positive words, you're gonna see things like optimistic, cheerful, enthusiastic, encouraging, very positive, bright words when it comes to that type of author's tone. For the negative words, you're going to see things like critical, pessimistic, disdain, bitter, angry, those really negative words. And then lastly, for neutral words, you're going to see words like objective, informative, detached, unbiased, really just a very neutral playing ground when it comes to the author's tone. So let's take a look at some examples of what that might look like in practice. So starting with positive, we have an example of, as I walk through the revitalized downtown area, the vibrant colors of the newly painted murals filled me with joy. The laughter of children playing in the fountain added to the lively atmosphere reminding me of the power of community spirit. So when we're looking at this positive tone, it's evident by the choice of words, right? So we have vibrant, 
joy, lively. It's the language that the author is using to create this uplifting, cheerful mood, focusing on the positive aspects of the scene. In contrast, when we're looking at negative tone, this example states, the once beautiful park lay in neglect, its paths overgrown, littered with debris. A sense of sadness washed over me as I observed the decay, a stark testament to years of disregard and forgotten promises. You see how the tone is completely changed here? We're looking at words like neglect, overgrown, littered, and sadness. The author is really trying to convey this sense of despair and neglect painted as a bleak and disheartening picture. And then lastly, when it comes to neutral tone, our example is, the report details the recent statistics on employment trends. In the last quarter, there was a 2% increase in job creation, primarily in the technology sector, while the manufacturing sector saw a slight decline. So this passage really just has kind of a neutral tone. It's really giving more of an informative stance on what is being conveyed, right? So they use words like objective, numbers, statistics. They're really clearly focused on providing objective data, objective information very clearly in regards to the use of this kind of passage. So let's do some practice questions. The question states, what tone does the author use in this passage? So the passage states, as the sun dipped below the horizon, it cast a golden glow over the meadow, transforming the scene into a blue of tranquility. The landscape, bathed in the soft light of dust, became a serene haven where every blade of grass seemed to stand still, as if in reverence of the day's end. It was as if the meadow itself, with its undulting hills and whispering breezes, was inviting onlookers into a realm of splendor, offering a momentary escape into its embrace. Let's see what we have as options. We have A, pest pessimistic and gloomy. Based on the keywords that we had, I don't believe that pessimistic and gloomy is going to be the correct answer. Detached and factual. Again, there's not a whole lot of facts. There's not a whole lot of statistics, objective data. So I would go ahead and say that that's probably also not going to be the correct answer. We have C, warm and appreciative. I do feel very warm when it comes to reading this kind of passage, right? They use words like soft dusk and tranquility and reverence. It does make you feel kind of warm and very appreciative of the environment. But let's look, take a look at our last example. Ironic and skeptical. Well, I wouldn't say that any of this is ironic or skeptical based on what we read. So based on all of our answers that we have, the correct answer is going to be C, warm and appreciative. In addition to positive, negative, and neutral tones, we can also have formal, nostalgic, tragic, and reflective tones. So when we're looking at formal tones, we're looking at factual, professional and a structured tone. You're going to commonly see these kind of tones in like textbooks, encyclopedias, as well as biographies. When it comes to nostalgic type of tones, you're looking for those more sentimental, longing for their past, romanticizing memories, those kind of tones. So you're going to see a lot of like reminiscing about the good old days kind of narratives when it comes to your passages. Next, we have tragic tones. So tragic tones are more about like sorrow, devastation, despair, fatal loss. And you're going to commonly see these in reports such as like newspapers, maybe even see it on the news, especially. And then lastly, we have reflective kind of tones. So that's kind of that introspective, thoughtful, self-examination, as well as contemplation. You're going to see a lot of personal pronouns, right? I, me, those type of things, those first persons. You're going to see a lot of discussions regarding past experiences and personal feelings being used. So let's take a look at an example or practice question of what that's going to look like. So for this practice question, the question states, what is the tone of the passage? So the passage states, the latest medical study conducted over a span of 10 years presents a comprehensive analysis of the effects of diet on heart health. Utilizing a large sample size and controlled variables, the researchers systematically gathered and interpreted data, ensuring scientific rigor in their findings. So here are our options. We have informal and conversational. Well, based on a lot of the words like statistics and comprehensive analysis that are being kind of thrown around, this really isn't an informal conversational piece, right? So we can automatically eliminate that. Next, we have B, formal and scientific. Absolutely, this is being conducted in a scientific manner. It's very formal. They're presenting their findings. So this could be the correct answer, but let's take a look at our other options. We have personal and subjective, not very personal 
personal, right? We're not looking at uh, particular words, like we're having a conversation and being personal. So we can automatically eliminate that. And then lastly, we have emotional and persuasive. There's not a whole lot of persuasive writing in here. There's not a lot of emotional writing in here. It's literally just the deliverance of facts of what's going on with this particular study when it comes to heart health. So based out of all of our options, the correct answer is going to be B, formal and scientific. So let's talk about biases versus stereotypes. They're two completely different things. So how do we figure out which is what, right? So a bias is a personal opinion in favor of or against a person, group, or thing. It can be either positive, it can be negative, and it often impacts decision-making and attitudes unconsciously, right? So an example of this could be a hiring manager believes candidates from Ivy League schools are always more qualified than those from other universities. This is one person's opinion or bias on a particular group of people. In this case, it's the candidates for this position. Now, with stereotypes, we're looking at a more fixed, generalized belief some people have towards a particular group or class of people. So it really is an oversimplified and often inaccurate perception that doesn't consider individual differences. So with biases, we're looking at individuals. With stereotypes, we're looking at groups. So an example of this could be people assume that all teenagers are irresponsible and addicted to social media. This is a stereotype as it's a generalized belief by a group of people that believes teens are irresponsible. So let's take a look at some additional examples just to help clear up the differences between that bias and that stereotype. So a bias could be, I prefer hiring younger people because they're more innovative. Whereas a stereotype would be, young people are always on their phone and can't focus for long periods. You see how that kind of changed? We're still talking about younger people, younger employees, but it's either coming from a bias standpoint when it comes to personal opinion, or it's coming from like a generalized group opinion when it comes to stereotypes. Let's take a look at another example. So when it comes to a bias, someone could say, in my opinion, older teachers are better because they have more experience. In contrast, in contrast to that, with the stereotype, we have older workers are not good with technology. You see how that changes from one's personal opinion to a generalization of a group? Let's take a look at our last example. I always choose younger doctors. I believe they're more up to date with medical advancements. That's a bias. Whereas with the stereotype, it could be young people are reckless and don't consider the consequences of their actions. Let's take a look at our first practice question. So what does the author's statement in the article suggest? So we're trying to figure out if we're looking at a bias or we're looking at a stereotype. So the question or the passage states, based on my extensive experience in the corporate sector, it's become evident that younger people often lack the same level of commitment and professionalism as their older counterparts. From what I've observed, many of the younger generation seems to prioritize personal interests over the company goals, a stark contrast to the dedication I noticed in employees from previous generations. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at a lot of I words, right? And based on my extensive experience, from what I've observed. So we're most likely looking at somebody's bias, right? So we have A. It is a factual representation of generational differences in the workplace. We can't really tell if this is fact, right? There's no statistics, no data, nothing that suggests this. So we can automatically eliminate that. Then we have B. It reflects a personal opinion based on the author's experiences. Well, this could absolutely be correct, right? Because they use words like my extensive experience, what I've observed. So let's put that on the back burner and look at our other answers. C, it's an unbiased observation about changing workplace cultures. Well, it really is kind of biased, right? We know we have a bias because they're speaking of their personal opinion, their personal observations. So we can automatically eliminate that. And then lastly, we have D. It is a statistical backed analysis of employees' behavior across generations. Again, there's no statistics here. So based out of all of the answers that we have, the most correct answer is going to be B. It reflects personal opinion based on the author's experiences. Just like with bias and stereotypes, we also have to distinguish between fact and opinion. So a fact is information that can be verified, it can be proven. So for example, and a fact can be the human heart typically beats between 60 to 100 beats per minute at rest. 
right? This is a statement of fact because it presents objective data about the human heart that can be verified and measured. It's based on that scientific observation that can be proven through empirical evidence. So when we're looking at fact, we're looking at things that make sense. They can be verified, they can be measurable. An extra tip when it comes to your T's is that if the passage contains any kind of numbers, it's almost always going to be a fact, okay? Facts are characterized by their lack of emotional content as well. You're not gonna see a lot of emotional words. They do not express the author's personal beliefs or biases in the information that's being presented. If you're seeing things like that, you're most likely looking at an opinion. So an opinion is subjective, it's based on personal views, emotions, and interpretations. So there's a short list of words that are really gonna be imperative when it comes to taking your teeth. Just like we saw with stereotypes and biases, you're gonna see opinion words like should, best, most, good, better, worst, seems, and more. You're gonna see those kind of words in sentences. So an opinion could be, jogging in the morning is the best form of exercise to maintain a healthy heart, right? That's that opinion word, best. This statement is an opinion because it expresses a personal belief and preference about jogging and the benefits of heart health. Opinions are gonna be subjective. They can vary from person to person. What constitutes the best form of exercise for one person can vary differently from another group of people or an individual. So making that statement really is gonna be opinion based. So let's take a look at some additional examples to hopefully help drive this home when you're taking your teas. First example is, it's 70 degrees outside. Yes, absolutely, that's fact. I can look on my phone, I can look at a news report, they're gonna tell me it's 70 degrees outside, it is verifiable, right? Versus an opinion of that could be, it's too hot outside, right? 70 degrees might not be hot to some people. Some individuals it could be, some it couldn't be. So that is absolutely somebody's personal opinion. Next we have the Amazon rainforest is the largest rainforest in the world covering over 5.5 million square kilometers. Again, we have a number, so that's fact. It's also verifiable, right? We can look in a textbook, we can look up news articles about the Amazon rainforest. We're able to verify that information. Whereas with an opinion, it could be the Amazon rainforest is the most, remember those words, most impressive rainforest in the world. That is again, someone's personal belief. It's their personal opinion. And then with our last example, we have as of 2023, the most powerful supercomputer can perform over a quintillion calculations per second. So again, that is verifiable. We have numbers and we are able to measure and verify those things. This is a fact. Whereas with an opinion, we have supercomputers are more important for scientific advancement than traditional research methods. So we got those uh, trigger words when we're looking at an opinion, right? That more, best, most, all of those type of words. So again, that last example is going to be an opinion. So let's take a look at some practice questions to help kind of bring all of this home. So our practice question states, which of the following best describes the statement? So the passage reads, according to a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, individuals who follow a Mediterranean rich diet in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains have a 25% lower risk of heart disease compared to those who follow a standard Western diet. So let's take a look at our options. An opinion about the Mediterranean diet. While it could potentially be seen as an opinion, we have statistical data in here, right? They say 25% lower risk of heart disease compared to those who follow a standard Western diet. So it's not somebody's personal belief, somebody's personal opinion. We have a lot of informational, factual, as well as statistical data. So we can automatically eliminate that. Next we have B, a fact based on a published medical study. Yes, right? That's exactly what I was talking about. It gives us a number. We know that there's a fact piece taking place. And it also talks about it being published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this absolutely could be answer B, but let's take a look at our last two answers. A hypothesis about dietary impacts on heart disease. Again, there's not really a hypothesis here. They've already done the experiment, which is why they have statistical data. So we can get rid of that. And the last one is an anecdotal observation about dietary preferences. Again, we can get rid of that. So based out of all of the options that we have available to us, B is going to be the most correct answer. Let's take a look at one more example. 
What type of statement is primarily presented in this passage? So the passage reads, many healthcare professionals believe that a plant-based diet is the most effective way to prevent chronic diseases. They argue that this diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and grains offers the best balance of nutrients for long-term health. So as we're reading this, I'm noticing some words, right? We see words like most effective, right? That most, that's usually an opinion word, but let's take a look at our answers and see what we have. So A, a fact supported by universal scientific consensus. Well, there's not really a whole lot of statistical data. There's not really a whole lot of informative information in here, so we can automatically eliminate that. A general observation based on common dietary patterns. We don't really have a whole lot of information about dietary patterns. It's specifically providing us information about one specific thing, that plant-based diet. So we can automatically eliminate that. C, an opinion held by some healthcare professionals. Well, absolutely, because as the passage starts, it states many healthcare professionals. And we know that it's an opinion because it uses words like most, right? So we can keep that one as a potential answer. And then our last option is a proven guideline for chronic de disease prevention. Again, it's not proven, there's no statistical data, there's no research study, nothing in here that suggests that this is a proven guideline. So based on all the answers that we have available to us, the most correct answer is gonna be C, an opinion held by some healthcare professionals. So let's move on to context clues. So context clues are hints a reader can use to discover the meaning of unfamiliar words and phrases. How are you gonna do that? Well, you're gonna look for words in the context themselves and the sentences around them. So let's look at some practice examples. So example one states, during the intense summer heat, the arid landscape seemed almost lifeless with only a few cacti dotting the horizon. So our word that's in red, arid, that's the one that we are trying to figure out what it means. So the phrases that they use around it are like intense summer heat. That's the description word about the landscape. It's almost lifeless. There's only a few cacti. So it's really suggesting that it's a dry, barren environment. So these clues help us to conclude that arid most likely means dry, lacking in moisture, typically used to describe a desert or some kind of similar environment. Our next example states the children's ebullient laughter filled the room as they excitingly shared stories of their day at school. So again, that word in red is what we are trying to define. So in order to define us, we have to use those context clues that are found around that word. So we have words like child's laughter filling the room and their behavior as being excitingly sharing stories. So it might suggest that this word means some kind of lively, enthusiastic, atmosphere. So in conclusion, we can kind of say that this word may mean that it's being full of energy, cheerful, as well as enthusiastic. When you're looking at context clues, you're looking at four different types of encounters that can take place. So starting with definition, this is when the author gives the meaning of the word right in the sentence. It's like having a mini dictionary with inside the text, right? So an example could be an arbitrarium, a garden devoted to trees was Jane's favorite place to visit. Here, the garden devoted to trees is directly giving you the definition of the word, right? So that is what we're seeing when we're looking at definition. Next, we're gonna look at restatement. So restatement typically involves rephrasing the unknown word in a way that makes it seem more clear. So an example of this could be, he was elated, so happy that he couldn't stop smiling. So happy is a restatement that clarifies what elated means. So that's what we're looking at when we have restatements. Our third choice can be contrast, right? So here the author is going to give you the opposite to help you understand the word. So a example of this could be, unlike his gregacious sister who loves socializing, Joe was shy and reserved, right? So the contrast to gregacious helps us understand that Joe is the opposite, indicating that he's more shy and reserved than his sister. And then for our last example, we have inference. So inference, you're gonna have to do a little bit of detective work when it comes to trying to figure out what a word means. So for an example here, she trudged through the snow, her feet heavy and cold. We can infer trudged implies that she had to do this kind of slow, 
laborious walk without being without it actually being directly stated within the example. So these are the top four kind of context clues that you're going to find when you're trying to define words on the T's. So our first question states, based on the passage, what can be inferred about Mark's personality? So we're trying to do a little detective work here, right? Because we have the word inferred. So the passage states, unlike his brother, who is loquacious and often the center of attention at social gatherings, Mark is reticent. He seldom initiates conversations and prefers to listen rather than speak in group settings. So let's take a look at our first option. We have A, he is outgoing and enjoys socializing. Well, we know that's not true because he tends to not want to initiate any conversations, right? He seldom does that. So he's not very good at the socializing aspect. So we can automatically eliminate A. B, he's reserved and less talkative than his brother. Absolutely, he's reserved. He doesn't really want to initiate a whole lot of con conversations and he prefers to listen rather than speak. So that's where that less talkative, he's reserved comes in. So this could be the correct answer, but let's look at our other options. He dislikes attending social gatherings. Well, we don't really know if that's true. He's there, but it doesn't really state that he doesn't like to be there, right? So we can automatically eliminate that one. And D, he is more popular than his two brothers. Well, we know that is incorrect, right? Because he is more reserved, he's more shy. He doesn't really wanna have a whole lot of conversations. So based on all of the options that we have available to us, the correct answer is going to be B. He is reserved and less talkative than his brother. Next, let's talk about figurative language. So figurative language refers to a set of literacy techniques that enhance your writing by adding new meaning or context beyond just the basic literal facts. So there's four types of different figurative language that you're going to encounter on the T's, and they are simile, personification, metaphor, and hyperbole. So let's break each one of these down. So when we're looking at simile types of figurative language, we're looking for words like like and as. There's gonna be a direct comparison between two ideas. So words like life is like a box of chocolates. I came in like a wrecking ball. Those are things that you're gonna see when it comes to simile. When it comes to metaphor, you're gonna be looking for words like is, and was. So that's a comparison that makes an implied or hidden connection between two ideas. So love is an open door. Life is a highway, right? That's more of a metaphor. So simile, we have like and as. Metaphor we have is and was. Next we have personification. So it's like giving a non-human object human characteristics. So the C was angry that day. Well, the C is not really angry, right? It's just probably was really choppy, but we're giving it human characteristics to make it more personal. And then lastly, we have hyperbole. So that's an exaggerated claim that emphasizes a point, right? So maybe you've had grandparents, I know I had grandparents, they used to say, I would walk 500 miles to get through to school in the snow with no shoes and no coat, right? That is a hyperbole. They're exaggerating that claim to emphasize their point. They probably did have to walk quite a bit of miles or quite a bit of way to get to school, but it doesn't mean that they walked 500 miles. They're really exaggerating that. And for our last section, we're gonna look at types of writing. So we have informative, persuasive, entertaining, descriptive, and expository. So let's take a look at each one. So we're gonna start with informative writing. So the main purpose is to provide information and facts, right? It's gonna focus on delivering data, statistics, and straightforward facts to educate the reader on a specific topic. So you're gonna see a lot of neutral and unbiased language. It's gonna avoid any kind of like persuasive language, personal opinions, we're strictly sticking to facts, numbers. You're gonna see a lot of this when it comes to like news reports, research papers, factual brochures, as well as encyclopedia entries. So that's where you're gonna see this the most. An example of this could be the Amazon rainforest spans over 2.1 million square miles housing diverse wildlife and ecosystems, right? We have numbers, it's a fact, we can identify it, we can measure it, we can look it up. Next we have persuasive writing. So really with persuasive writing, the main objective is to convince or persuade the reader to agree with the author's point of view or to take a specific action. It's about influencing the reader's thoughts as well as their actions. So you're going to see a lot of things like emotional appeals, strong opinions, and argumentative techniques. It can include rhetorical questions, evidence, persuasive language to make a compelling case. 
So examples where you might see this could be like opinion editorials, advertisements, speeches, cover, la cover letters, and even sales pitches. An example of this could be implementing renewable energy sources can significantly reduce global carbon emissions and save our planet, right? This is giving the person an action. It's, it's appealing to their emotional uh, appeal because again, we're talking about reducing those global carbon emissions by implementing this one piece of thing. Next, we have entertaining writing. So entertaining, the goal of this is really to provide the reader with enjoyment, amusement, as well as pleasure. It's meant to engage and captivate the audience's attention about what the author is trying to convey. So you're gonna see a lot of like narrative techniques, humor, imaginative storytelling, and creative language. It's really characterized by the ability to evoke emotion, whether it's about laughter, suspense, excitement, or other feelings, right? So you're gonna see this in a lot of like novels, short stories, comedic articles, plays, and even some kind of poetry. So an example of this could be, the wizard vanished into a cloud of smoke, leaving behind only a trace of sparkling embers, right? It's very imaginative, it's very storytelling, it's exciting, it's trying to get you in that mood, to give you that pleasure. Our fourth one is descriptive writing. So the goal when it comes to descriptive writing is really to paint a picture in the reader's mind. It's about describing and detailing a scene, person, place, or an object to make the reader visualize and experience what it is that they are trying to convey. So characteristics of this could be like using sensory details, figurative language, like similes and metaphors that we talked about before. They can also use evocative descriptions. It's really gonna focus on your five senses, right? You really should have something about your sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste to create a strong impression. When we're looking at examples of this, you're gonna see this in like literature fiction, travel writing, nature writing, character sketches, as well as even like personal essays. So an example of this could be the sunset painted the sky in hues of orange, pink, and purple, casting a warm glow over the tranquil sea. See how they kind of painted that picture? They want you to feel what it is that they're doing, where they are at, what it looks like. And then lastly, we have expository writing. So with this kind of writing, it's going to aim to explain, clarify, and provide information about a topic. What it's also going to inform, it's going to go further into offer a deeper understanding or insight into a subject matter. So you're going to see elements like, you know, argumentation, comparison, analysis, cause and effect, relationships. It's going to break down complex ideas into more understandable parts. So you're going to see this a lot when it comes to academic essays, how-to guides, textbooks, business reports, as well as technical writing. So an example of this could be photosynthesis in plants involves converting sunlight into energy using water and carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen as a byproduct. It's informative and it also explains the process, right? So when we're using terms like informative and expository writing, they're often used interchangeably, but they do have subtle differences between them. Informative is going to be more about stating the facts. Expository is going to be more about going into the details and the steps about those facts. So let's take a look at some practice questions to tie this all together. So our question states, which writing style does the above passage represent? So we're looking at persuasive, descriptive, informative, or narrative. So let's take a look. The Great Barrier Reef located off the coast of Queensland, Australia, is the world's largest coral reef system comprised of over 2,900 individual reefs and 900 islands. It stretches for over 1,400 miles and can be seen from space. The reef is a hotspot for biodiversity, supporting a wide range of marine life, including numerous species of fish, mollusks, birds, and sea turtles. So when we're taking a look at this, we have a lot of numbers, right? We have a lot of statistical data. So remember when we're looking at informative writing, we're looking at that statistical data. We're not, it doesn't really go much more into detail about like how the sea life live and how they work together and why it's a bio hotspot for biodiversity. So we can automatically eliminate it as being expository writing. Because it has a lot of those numbers that 2,900 individual reefs, 900 islands, 1,400 miles can be seen from space, all of that information, really we're looking at more informative writing. So our correct answer is going to be C, informative. There are three concepts that you're gonna to need to know when it comes to citing evidence from a text, including predictions, 
interpretations, and conclusions. And I'll give you a simple way to remember each one. As always, the number one thing you are gonna to want to do every single time when it comes to answering questions about citing evidence is to read the question first. It's important to know what the question is specifically asking before you read the passage. So starting first with predictions. This is like being a little detective and guessing what might actually happen next. So for example, if a story mentions dark clouds gathering, you can predict that there might be some kind of rain or storm that's coming. It's like actually looking up at the clouds in real life and guessing what is actually going on. Is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain? It's the same thing. Next up, we have interpretations. So think of this as like being a psychologist and understanding the deeper meaning that the author is trying to imply. So say a character in the text keeps fidgeting and avoiding eye contact. You might interpret that as they're being nervous or they could potentially be hiding something. It's like noticing a friend's body language in real life and understanding that they're most likely anxious. And lastly, we have conclusions. So this is where you become a judge and you're gonna ultimately decide what the text is really saying at the end. End. So if a story ends with the character smiling and celebrating, you can conclude that it's a happy ending. It's like watching the end of a movie and understanding the story's overall message. Let's take a look at some practice questions. Starting with our first practice question, based on the passage, what prediction can be made about the upcoming events in the story? The passage reads, the sky was overcast, a blanket of gray extending as far as the eye could see. Natalie noted the heavy, oppressive air and the way the leaves on the trees suddenly stilled as if in anticipation. She remembered the last time the sky looked like this, barely a month ago when the town was hit by a storm that left them without power for days. So our potential answers are, Natalie prepare for an outdoor adventure. Well, that's probably not going to happen if it's looking very ominous outside, right? The town will experience calm and pleasant weather. Well, based on the way that she describes what's happening, that's probably not going to be the correct answer. C. There will be a significant storm that may impact the town. Well, based on what she said, based on past experience, it sounds like that could potentially be the answer, but let's move on. Natalie will leave town to escape the bad weather. Well, it doesn't really mention anything about her leaving town to escape this weather. So out of all of the options that we have available to us, C is going to be the most correct answer. The next question is, based on the passage, how can Mr. Dalton's feelings towards the ancient text be interpreted? In the quiet library, Mr. Dalton's gaze lingered over the ancient text, his, his expression a mixture of awe and curiosity. These books, he whispered, hold secrets of a lost civilization waiting to be rediscovered. Their knowledge is like a buried treasure, priceless and rare. So our options are, A, he is indifferent and uninterested in the books. Well, based on what he's saying about the books, that doesn't seem like that's the correct answer. B, he finds the books outdated and useless. Well, again, he uses things like these books hold secrets of lost civilizations. While they might be outdated based on when they actually took place, they're definitely not useless in his eyes. C, he is deeply fascinated and values the knowledge in books. Yes, absolutely, that could be our correct answer. But lastly, D, he is confused and overwhelmed by the contents of these books. Well, he's definitely not confused by them. So based out of all of the options that we have available to us, again, C is going to be the correct answer. So let's talk about identifying theme in a story. So a theme is a significant concept interwoven through a narrative. It's really going to transcend that plot and that synopsis, delving much more deeper into the overall meaning of the story. So that theme is going to bridge a broad concept about life or society with the narrative's events. So often a theme addresses fundamental questions that are going to be posed by the story, such as really what defines a family? What are our deepest fears? And it's going to answer these questions through the form of the story's theme, like family goes beyond blood relations, or our greatest fear can be the loss of our unique identity, right? So theme differs from the main idea, which is the central topic of the story, and from the summary, which recounts the story's events. While the main idea and summary deal with what the story is about and what is happening in it, theme is really going to offer that insightful or that moral compass for the reader as it's applying it to their own life. So what's great about themes is themes are universally relatable 
concepts. So for instance, if I share an experience about getting a questionable funnel cake at a carnival and ultimately ending up with food poisoning, the theme isn't specifically about packing my own food or about avoiding that particular food stand because not everybody has carnivals. Instead, it's really a broader message like the importance of being prepared in case something like this happens. The theme resonates more widely because while not everyone may encounter a specific hot dog stand or specific funnel cake stand, everyone can understand the value of preparation. So think of a theme as being similar to finding the moral of a story, but it's really going to have a little bit of a slight difference. So a moral directly imparts a specific lesson, whereas a theme might encompass a lesson, but it isn't limited to just that. It can be more abstract. To unearth that story's theme, you have to consider asking yourself some of these overarching questions. What did the character learn? In what way did they grow or transform? What motivated their actions? What has changed in the story's end? And what lingers in your mind long after the story is over? Let's take a look at an example of what this might actually look like when you're taking the teas. So let's take a look at these questions with this folklore called the Caterpillar's Wisdom. In a lush, vibrant forest where the trees danced with the breeze and the flowers whispered secrets, there lived a young caterpillar named Cora. Cora was unlike other caterpillars. She was born with vibrant, multicolored patches all over her body, making her stand out amongst the green foliage. Cora loved exploring, but her unique appearance often attracted attention, making her an easy target for birds and other predators. Her friends, more camouflaged and less noticeable, warned her about the dangers of being conspicuous. One day, while venturing out, Cora met an old, wise butterfly named Alara. Alara listened to Cora's worries about her bright colors and smiled gently. Your uniqueness is your strength, she said. In time, you will see. Not long after, a group of birds spotted Cora. She remembered Alara's words and instead of hiding, displayed her colors more boldly. These birds, dazzled by her beauty, decided not to harm her, remarking that something so beautiful must be cherished. Emboldened by the experience, Cora started to view her colors as a gift rather than a curse. She began to embrace her uniqueness, no longer trying to blend in, but rather to stand out. As autumn came, Cora prepared to cocoon. She wrapped herself in a silk chrysalis, pondering over her life and her transformation. When she finally emerged, she became a breathtaking butterfly, her wings a mosaic of the colors she had once feared. Cora fluttered back to her friends, who were amazed by her transformation. She shared her story, teaching them the value of embracing her uniqueness and seeing strengths in what makes them different. Cora became known throughout the forest not only for her beauty, but for her wisdom. She reminded everyone that what makes you different makes you special. So looking back at our questions, what did the characters learn? Well, Cora learned that her uniqueness was her strength and not a weakness to be hidden. In what way did they grow or transform? Cora grew from a self-conscious caterpillar into a confident wise butterfly who embraced her unique qualities. What motivated their actions? Well, initially fear and the desire to fit in motivated Cora, but later that wisdom that she got from Alara and her own experiences taught her the value of showcasing her uniqueness. What has changed by the story's end? Well, by the end, Cora transformed not only physically into a butterfly, but also in her perspective, seeing her distinct colors as a gift. And then lastly, what stays with you after the story is over? So that enduring message is about embracing and celebrating our unique traits that can ultimately transform our vulnerabilities into strengths. Let's take a look at a quick practice question of how this will be applied on the tease. So here's our practice question. What way did Taro grow and transform in the story? So the story states, in a small coastal village, there lived a humble fisherman named Taro. Known for his exceptional skills, Taro was most admired for his humility and kindness. During a fierce storm, he bravely saved a drowning traveler, not for fame or reward, but out of sheer compassion. Taro became a hero in his village, yet he always credited his success to the unity and support of his fellow villagers. He often said, alone we are drops, but together 
we are an ocean. Let's take a look at our potential answers. So A, he became the most skilled fisherman in the village. Well, it doesn't really talk about that. While he may be exceptionally skilled in his fishermen, we don't know about the other, other villagers. B, he learned the importance of fishing for survival. Well, that's not really something that was discussed in this particular passage, so we can automatically eliminate B. C, he transformed from a lone fisherman to a community hero. Well, absolutely, that is something that they talked about. He lived as a humble fisherman. He ultimately saved someone's life that was drowning, so he did become a community hero, so that could be the potential uh, correct answer. But lastly, we have D, he realized the dangers of fishing during the storms. Well, really the end of it was more about community, the more about him becoming a hero and him saying that I'm only as good as my community. So we can automatically eliminate that. So out of all the answers that we have available to us, C is the correct answer. Our next question states, what stays with you after the story about Sarah is over? So Sarah is a high school student, was facing immense pressure while preparing for an important exam just like you all are. Observing her stress, her mother shared her own past experiences with exam anxiety and emphasizing the need for balance. She advised Sarah to dedicate time to study, to relax, and to pursue hobbies. Inspired, Sarah modified her routine, balancing her study time with leisure activities. She not only performed well on her exam, but she also learned the crucial life lesson of maintaining balance. So out of our potential answers, we have A, the lessons of balancing work and relaxation in life. Yes, that is absolutely something that was discussed during this passage. Let's look at our other answers. B, the role of parental advice in academic success. Well, that wasn't the overall theme of the story, but that was something that they did talk about. C, the pressure of high school exams. Well, while high school exams have a lot of pressure associated with them, that is not the overall theme of this passage. And then lastly, D, the techniques of effective exam preparation. Well, again, they didn't really talk about exam preparation. They really talked about that balance. So out of each of the potential options we have available to us, A is the most correct answer. Next, we're going to discuss claims and counterclaims. So many of you have social media accounts and you've probably noticed that disagreements are common. Why? Because each of us holds a different opinion. In discussions or meetings, we often prefer harmony, wishing nobody would disagree. However, disagreements are going to be inevitable due to the diverse viewpoints of each individual person. This leads us to the concepts of claims and counterclaims. So a claim is your main argument. It's the stance, your opinion, or conclusion on a particular issue or topic essential to the thesis statement of your viewpoint. Remember, a well-constructed claim doesn't just present your argument, but it also situates within a broader context, which often includes acknowledging and addressing any potential counter arguments that may take place. Conversely, the counterclaim is essentially the opposite in that it is a statement that is going to challenge, refute, and oppose that initial claim. In debates, this opposition is typical as teams often split into affirmative and negative sides. For instance, let's consider a topic like mandatory overtime for nurses should be implemented to ensure adequate staffing. If that's the main argument or claim, a counterclaim could be mandatory overtime for nurses should not be implemented as it leads to nurse burnout. And that's going to have to be backed up by specific reasons and evidence. And as we know, in today's nursing field, I'm sure that you're not going to have a difficult time finding that evidence. So a counterclaim is going to challenge that initial claim presenting an alternative viewpoint. So starting with our question, what is the main claim made by Sarah in the story? So the story states, in a quaint town of Greenville, a debate was brewing among the residents about the operating hours of their cherished public Public library. The library, a cornerstone of the community, had always closed at 6 p.m. However, a recent proposal to extend the hours until 9 p.m. sparked conversations across the town. During a community meeting, Sarah, the head librarian, took to the floor. She passionately argued, the extension of the library's operating hours until 9 p.m. is essential for the enrichment of our community. By staying open later, we can provide invaluable access to resources for working adults and students. 
These groups often struggle to utilize the library due to their daytime commitments. Furthermore, extended hours would allow for more community programs and workshops in the evenings, benefiting everyone. So what is the main claim? Our options are A, the library needs to update its collection of books. Well, it's not really something that we discuss, so we can eliminate that. B, extending the library's hours will significantly benefit the community. Absolutely. That's explicit evidence. It's specifically stated within the text. C, the library should hire more staff. That wasn't something that was argued at all. They were only discussing particularly the hours. And then D, the community does not use a library enough. Well, again, that is something that is not what was stated. It was stated that they're using the library constantly and they want more people to use the library. So out of all the options we have available to us, B is going to be the most correct answer. Now let's talk about evaluating resources. So when we're evaluating sources, we're going to need to identify where that source is coming from. Is it a primary source? secondary or tertiary source. So each source is going to serve a unique purpose in building a robust argument. So primary sources are often going to be direct evidence about a person, an event, or a phenomenon. So for instance, Marie Curie's lab notebook is a quintessential primary source. Although its radioactive nature makes it a little bit difficult to handle, these sources can be anything from the time period or period that's being studied. So say we have a World War I soldier's journal. That's considered authoritative. It's directly from the person that experienced the events. So secondary sources, on the other hand, are created using primary sources. So they're going to analyze, interpret, and restate primary source information. So examples of of this could be newspaper articles or even some textbooks. While primary sources are authoritative, secondary sources are going to be more persuasive. So it's important to note that what defines a primary or secondary source can vary based on the context and academic discipline, just know that primary are going to be much more authoritative when it comes to the T's and secondary um, sources are going to be more persuasive. And lastly, tertiary sources include information from both primary and secondary sources, but don't present new information or any kind of new analysis. So common examples can be textbooks, abstracts, and reference works such as dictionaries and encyclopedias. Wikipedia, for example, which many of us use, is a tertiary source. So let's take a look at an example of what this is going to look like when it comes to your T's. So let's explore the topic of the effects of social media on mental health. The primary source can be an original study or survey titled The Impact of Social Media on Youth Mental Health, which was published in a psychology journal. This is a primary source as it presents original research data and findings directly from the researchers. A secondary source could be a documentary film analyzing various studies on social media's impact on mental health, including interviews with psychologists and summaries of several key studies like the one that we had mentioned before. This is a secondary source because it reviews and discusses findings from the primary research, providing a more complex concepts on the context as well as additional perspectives. And then lastly, we have tertiary sources. So this could be an entry in a textbook on digital media psychology that summarizes findings from various studies on social media, as well as mental health, including the mentioned research study, as well as the documentary documentary film. So this is a tertiary source as it compiles information from multiple primary and secondary resources without actually providing any kind of new analysis of those two. So let's take a look at an example. Which of the following best describes the source used in a study mentioned in the passage? So the passage states, a recent experimental study published in the Journal of Environmental Science, explores the effect of urban green spaces on air quality. The research team collected air samples from various urban parks and analyzed them for pollutants like carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and particulate matter. The study found a significant reduction in these pollutants within the green spaces compared to nearby urban areas without such spaces. So our potential answers are A, a primary source, as it involves original research and data collection in urban green spaces. Yes, absolutely, this is all original data. 
B, a secondary source as it summarizes findings from an environmental study. Well, again, it's not really coming from a secondary source. It's not providing new analysis based on an original source or primary source. So we can eliminate that. A tertiary source as it provides an overview of urban environmental issues. Well, again, we're not taking our primary and our secondary sources and putting them together without new analysis. So we can automatically eliminate that. And then lastly, a review article critiquing existing environmental policy. Policies. We didn't discuss anything about environmental policies, so we can automatically eliminate that. The correct answer to this question is going to be A, as it is a primary source. So what are rhetorical devices? How can you effectively convince someone to understand and accept your perspective? Where Aristotle, a renowned Greek philosopher, offered insightful strategies for persuasion. He identified three critical techniques known as the three appeals, which are fundamental in persuading an audience to support an argument. These appeals are named ethos, pathos, and logos. And each of them are going to target a different aspect of the audience response and reasoning. So starting with ethos, ethos seeks to earn the audience's trust in the speaker or writer, emphasizing credibility and reliability. So for example, gaining the trust of a doubtful audience hinges on the person that is presenting showing that the speaker is going to be credible, knowledgeable, and has good intentions. Ethos is established by citing relevant experiences, outlining qualifications, or utilizing reputable sources to demonstrate expertise in a subject matter. Now, when it comes to pathos, pathos really taps into the audience's emotions. It's encouraging a belief through emotional connection and empathy. This technique is widely used in various forms of popular media, including movies, books, as well as music. When it comes to academic writing, merely evoking emotions is not going to be enough. To effectively employ pathos in a scholarly context, authors are going to use vivid, descriptive language. This includes the strategic use of emotions, powerful adjectives, verbs that can paint a clear emotional resonant picture for the reader. And then lastly, we have logos. On the other hand, it's going to engage the audience's logic, right? Logos, logic. It's going to engage their logic and their reason, persuading them with well-reasoned arguments and logical consistencies. This is achieved by constructing a solid case of using facts, figures, well-reasoned evidence. By presenting arguments that are logically sound, the position of the conclusion as rational and well-founded makes counter arguments seem less convincing or even irrational, depending on what they're talking about. Let's take a look at some practice questions of how they might ask this on the tease. The first question states, which theme in the passage reflects the use of ethos? Remember, we're looking for credibility and reliability. So in my 20 years as a heart surgeon, I have seen the direct impact of healthy eating on cardiovascular health. This experience coupled with extensive research has led me to advocate for a balanced diet as a cornerstone of heart health. I stand before you not just as a doctor, but as someone who has personally witnessed the transformative power of good nutrition. So our options are A, I have seen the direct impact of healthy eating or cardiovascular health. Again, we're not really gaining their trust. We're not showing our credibility and reliability here. So we can automatically eliminate that. B, this experience coupled with extensive research has led me to advocate for a balanced diet. Again, there's not really any credibility here. It's not any reliability. While he talks about his experience, we're not really seeing specifically how this is credible. C, I stand before you not as a doctor, but as someone who has personally witnessed. This is huge, right? This is credibility. I am a doctor. Reliability, I have witnessed. So yes, C would make the most sense in regards to a correct answer, but then we have D. The transformative power of good nutrition. Again, there's no credibility here. So out of all the options that we have available to us, C is going to be the most correct answer. Our next question states, what part of the passage is an example of pathos? So remember, we're looking for those vivid imageries. We're looking for it to invoke some kind of emotion. That's what we're looking at in this particular passage. So as I walked through the remnants of a once thriving coral reef, I was struck by the devastating effects of ocean pollution. The vivid colors and bustling marine life I remembered from my childhood were replaced by a 
bleached coral and eerie silence. This heartbreaking scene is a grim reminder of what we stand to lose if we don't take action to protect our oceans. This sounds like a very persuasive writing, right? So let's take a look at our options. We have A, the devastating effects of ocean pollution. While we do invoke some kind of emotion when it comes to that particular statement, it isn't really painting a vivid imagery of what we're looking at, right? So we can automatically eliminate that. We have B, the vivid colors and bustling marine life I remember from my childhood. While we are looking at more of an imagery thing here, we're looking at vivid colors, we're looking at bustling marine life, it's not really stating specifically what it is that we want or what it is that we're trying to convey. So keep that on the back burner for now, but I don't think that's our correct answer. C, this heartbreaking scene is a grim reminder of what we stand to lose. This is excellent, right? We have a heartbreaking scene. That is our imagery. We know that our oceans are becoming more polluted. And they also talk about what their position is, what we stand to lose, what it is that they're trying to persuade or convey to you. So C seems like it's going to be the most correct, but let's take a look at D. If we don't take action to protect our oceans, that's not really providing us with a lot more information that we need in order to make an informed decision. So out of all the options we have available to us, C is going to be the most correct answer. This particular sentence is effectively employing that pathos by evoking emotions of sadness as well as loss. It's that description of that heartbreaking scene, the reminder of what could be lost is appealing to that particular reader's emotions. So out of B and C, those two options, C is going to be the most correct answer. Lastly, let's take a look at qualitative and quantitative research. So quantitative research is designed to test hypotheses and and typically involves data collection that's going to result in a numerical or graphical representation. This method generally necessitates a larger sample group and the gathered numbers are analyzed using mathematics and statistical techniques, meaning that it's going to be able to be measurable. So that's our quantitative data. Think quantity, right? That's a number, quantity, quantitative. Conversely, we have qualitative research, which is utilized primarily for formulating hypotheses. So unlike quantitative research, it produces data that is expressed in words rather than numbers. It often requires a smaller number of respondents, meaning that the data cannot be measured mathematically. The analysis for qualitative research involves summarizing, categorizing, and interpreting the collective verbal and textual data. So now that we understand the differences between the two, the next question is, what method should we use for each? Well, the decision really is going to be straightforward. If your objective is to confirm or test a specific theory or hypothesis, the quantitative approach is going to be the most suitable approach. However, if your aim is to gain a deeper understanding of or to explore a concept or idea in depth, then you're probably going to want to use a more qualitative approach in the way that you approach this particular study. So using the context of nursing, let's apply quantitative and qualitative approaches. So if I wanted to adopt a more quantitative approach, I might survey 300 nursing students at a university asking them to rate questions like, on a scale of one to five, how satisfied are you with the clinical training part of your course? Based on that collected data, I would perform statistical analysis and could conclude something like on average, nursing students rate their clinical training experience 4.2 out of five. That would be a more quantitative approach. Conversely, if I chose a more qualitative approach, I would conduct an in-depth interview with maybe 15 nursing students asking open-ended questions like, how do you feel about your clinical training in the nursing program? Or what improvements would you suggest for the clinical training aspect of your course? After transcribing these interviews, I would analyze them to identify common patterns or themes across all of the interviews. So for instance, I might find a recurring sentiment like many students express a desire for more hands-on experience and direct mentorship during their clinical rotation. This would be a more qualitative approach. Let's take a look at some practice questions of what it will look like on the T's. Let's take a look at our question. Is the research method used in this study quantitative or qualitative? So the study states a group of researchers conducted an interview of 20 nurses working in emergency departments 
to explore their experiences and coping strategies during high stress situations. The interview consisted of open-ended questions allowing nurses to share detailed personal experiences and insights. The researchers then analyzed the transcripts to identify common themes and insights about stress management and emergency nursing. So right off the bat, we have a qualitative study. We have a small group of nurses and they're looking at coping strategies and their experiences and they're asking open-ended questions. So automatically we can eliminate anything about quantitative. So A, quantitative because it focuses on specific groups of professionals, we can eliminate that. And uh, let me see, C, it's quantitative because it uses statistical methods to analyze data. Automatically can eliminate that. We're looking at a qualitative research study. So we have B and we have D. B, qualitative because it involves analyzing personal experiences shared in interviews. Yes, absolutely. They're analyzing everybody's personal experiences and looking for common themes. And then we have D, because it employs a large sample size in interviews. Well, like we know, qualitative research is going to have smaller sample sizes. That's why we only have 20. So we can automatically eliminate D. Out of all of the answers we have available to us, B is going to be the most correct answer. Whew, that was a lot. That's everything that you're going to need to know in order to ace that reading section of the ATITs. As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources available to you to help you ace those exams. And as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Bye!